So we just left off with an example where we were looking at the different types of alternative hypotheses in a hypothesis test. And so the example we left off with was a left-tailed alternative where um, we were looking at electronic chips and we were trying to determine um, whether or not the chips were lasting a minimum of 630 hours, which had been claimed by the manufacturer. So just as a refresher here, um, we had said our null hypothesis was that the mean length was 630 hours. And what we wanted to test as an alternative was that these chips were in fact on average not lasting 630 hours. So less than 630 hours would be a left tailed alternative. So what we're asked in this question is, okay, suppose we're told that we know the population standard deviation of the lifetime of electronic chips is 22 hours. So what they're telling us there is that sigma is 22 hours. And we are told for a sample of size 30 electronic chips, so n is 30. So we looked at 30 different chips and we found a mean lifetime of 615 hours. So the sample mean x bar was 615 hours. And so what we're trying to figure out is how likely is it that we're gonna observe a sample mean of 615 hours if our sample size is 30 and the population standard deviation is 22 hours. So how likely should sound to you like a probability question. Um, we are going back to chapter six information here to um, try and figure this question out. Um, essentially what we're saying is if we assume that the null hypothesis is true, that means that this distribution of X bar, so all the possible sample means X bar, would be right at the population mean, which is 630. So our null hypothesis here is that the mean is 630. And what we want to know is, well, how likely is it that I would observe an X bar of only 615, which would be down here somewhere? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to know the spread, right? The spread of all possible sample means, and that's sigma sub X bar. And we learned back in chapter six that sigma sub X bar is equal to sigma over the square root of N. We know both of those things. Sigma is 22, N was 30. And so if we go to the calculator for a second here, We've got 22 over the square root of 30 is 4.01, we'll round that to 017. And so if we label three standard deviations in each direction, we're going by increments of about 4.017. What we want to do is we want to find out, well, where is this, um, you know, where's this z-score? Where's x-bar going to lie on here? Um, and so we're going to do that again going back to chapter 6, um, but we're looking at the z-score for x-bar, right? The mean, not just x. So we need to subtract the mean of all possible sample means and divide by the standard deviation of all possible sample means x bar is 615. We're subtracting mu sub x bar, which is equal to mu in our null hypothesis, that's 630. So again, we're calculating this, assuming the null hypothesis is true. And sigma sub x bar, we just found that is 4.017. And so if we do that calculation, we've got 615 minus 630 divided by 4.017 gives us negative 3.73. So remember that's a z-score, right? So what we're saying is that observing a sample mean of 615 
if the true population mean is really 630, um, that's going to be three, almost four standard deviations below the mean, right? So we would be way down here by the time we were at 615. And we want that little sliver of probability, right? We want to know how likely is it that I'm going to observe this sample mean of 615 if the true population mean is really 630. So we can find that using the um, normal CDF. So we're going to do normal CDF. That's under second distribution. Again, this is all from chapter six. Scrolling down to normal CDF. Our lower is basically, we're just gonna use negative a million, but we're looking essentially at negative infinity. Our upper is where we're stopping. Um, we're using a z-score, so we're gonna go all the way to negative 3.73. Our mean is zero, our standard deviation is one. Again, we're using um, z-score. And you'll see it's very, very tiny. It's converting it to scientific notation. So this minus five means we're moving that decimal place five places to the left. So we did negative a million to negative 3.73, mean of zero, standard deviation of one. And that gave us Point zero 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 zero. So we're moving it five places. So there's four zeros, and then that nine, five, and we'll round it to eight. Okay. Um, so that answers our question. That's this area right up here, the area to the left of six fifteen in this distribution. Point zero 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 nine. Five, eight. Um, how likely is it that we would observe this sample mean if the population mean lifetime is really 630 hours? Well, it's extremely unusual, right? Very, very small probability. Remember, probabilities are between zero and one. This is almost zero, okay? Well, so what does that mean if we're trying to interpret here? Um, what that means is that one of two things has happened. Um, one, the null hypothesis, which was that the mean is 630, is true. And we just happened to have observed an extremely unusual event. In other words, an event that only happens, um, if we move change this to a percentage, right, only happens 0 0.00958% of the time. Um, so one option is that the null hypothesis is really true. The mean really is 630 hours. And we just happen to have observed something that hardly ever happens, right? The other option, right? So, or we said one of two things has happened. The other thing is that the null hypothesis is not really true, right? So the other option here is that the null hypothesis is not true, which would mean we had evidence to conclude that the alternative hypothesis, which is that the mean is less than 630 hours, and that's the other option, right? In other words, what we just found is that if the mean is really 630, and we observe 615, right, down here, what we just found is that is extremely unusual, right? It only happens 
0.00958% of the time. What we're saying here, and I think you can see it if I just draw another curve, is, well, if the mean is not really 630, and it's really somewhere less than 630, now observing that 615 seems much more likely, right? There's a much bigger area here um, than this tiny little tail area up here. So the other option is that that null hypothesis is not true, and we have evidence to conclude the alternative hypothesis. And so that's the basic logic of hypothesis testing. Um, if this probability, we call it a p-value, we'll talk more about that soon, if this probability or this p-value is very small, it tends to indicate that that null hypothesis is not true, and in fact the alternative is true. We'll talk more about that soon.